During the Vietnam War, African-American soldiers heeded the call to duty. I hadn't been anywhere but Marshtown all my life. I volunteered for the draft, 1968. If you were going to Nam, you knew there's a possibility that you are not coming back. The last thing you have time to do in the middle of the war is grieve. You're too busy trying to make sure that no one's grieving for you. Now, a true American on East Tennessee PBS. It's hard to talk about it with my son. And my son has asked me several questions about uh, what I did in the wrong, and I won't tell him. If it wasn't monsoon, it was 120 degrees. You stayed wet all the time. So even a lot of people got jungle rot, feet stayed wet all the time. Not knowing what we we're trying to accomplish was a big problem, and then when you returned back to the United States. It didn't make no difference whether you were there or not. Life went on, and, and that was it. I think what angered me and probably hurt me more than anything else was the welcome home we didn't get. August 7th, 1967, went to Vietnam. Stayed away 18 months. 18 months too long. The 1960s were a time when gainful employment was sometimes difficult to find in East Tennessee. For many young men, their job search would be hampered by the draft. People wouldn't hire you because they knew you. Chances are you're going to have to go to the military to be drafted. So that was hanging over your head. The draft tended to fall more heavily on those of lower status, lower incomes, and particularly the South, which was a poorer part of the country, was more affected by um, this discrepancy. And so draft calls hit more deeply into southern rural areas and southern cities than they did necessarily in the north and the west of the country. I got drafted March 1967, two weeks before my 25th birthday. If I got drafted, it would be three years, and if I volunteered for the draft, it would be two years, so I volunteered for the draft, 1968. However, many young men saw military service as an appealing option. Despite the dangers of service during the Vietnam War, the military offered financial opportunities African Americans could not get at home. I was, uh... Working on the farm, I know I could do better than that, so I just went and joined the Army. The ones that volunteered were sort of looking for a career or somewhere to be, because like I said, most of the outlined areas were poverty stricken, you know, around here to a certain extent, and they were getting a paycheck every month. The military services, which were formally integrated by Harry Truman uh, back in the late 1940s, were in effect seen by many African Americans as far more open to upward mobility than uh, many other avenues in American life. Everybody was young and didn't, hadn't kept up with the political parts of it, didn't have an idea really what we were doing. It started out as a patriotic thing. I wanted, I wanted to fight for my country. It took me a while to realize that there were two sides to the country, and I was on the wrong side. New recruits left everything they knew behind, heeding the call of duty. It was different leaving Marshtown and going to boot camp, because I hadn't been anywhere but Marshtown all my life. At training bases in the Deep South, soldiers prepared for combat in Vietnam. On the fort, everything was integrated. Louisiana was, was not integrated in, in most cases. Native American and African Americans could not be served uh, in and around uh, Fort Polk, Louisiana. Exercise. 
your boot camp experience is limited because you were scared. You was a young man, you were scared, and 99% of the guys that were there never had been away from home. You know that once you got through with your advanced training, if you were going to NAM, you knew there's a possibility that you were not, were not coming back. And that's the, that's the hardest part to accept. It took me a long time to accept that. I wrote a four-page letter to my mom and my brothers and sisters and said, I'm off to see the wizard. Many new arrivals landed at Cameron Air Base for in-processing. There, American soldiers would get their first taste of life in Vietnam. New troops received additional training. They carried you through a two-week training, uh, firing your weapon, getting you acclimated to working in the bush. After orientation, the soldiers received their orders and were assigned jobs in the field. The grunt, ground pounder. I had got assigned to the 11 Army Cav. I was a tanker over there. And then there's a, a 24 Corps as a tanker. 23rd Engineer Battalion. I had a good job. When I first got up, when I was in Aunt Kay, I worked at night uh, building an airport runway. 560 of light maintenance. I volunteered and asked to be in maintenance, a mechanic. I get to Quinion and I get dropped off at Gray's Registration. So I'm thinking, I get to type the toe tags, which is not enjoyable, but I think there, there might have been two white guys in there. Everybody else was black. You had a large number of troops in the supply areas, in functioning behind the lines. And this is where racial conflict was most severe. It was behind the lines in Vietnam. Racial conflict, segregation, um, hostility, uh, some of the worst instances of unrest happened behind the lines and was not in actual combat infantry where soldiers had to rely on themselves to stay alive. Hi there, this is Barbara Randolph. The North Vietnamese targeted black American soldiers through radio propaganda. We had a radio station and at night, Hannah Hannah would break in on the frequency and talk about the black soldiers, won't know why we was over there fighting. You need to come to our side. Uh. How are you, G.I. Joe? It seems to me that most of you are poorly informed about the going of the war. They say nothing about a correct explanation of your presence over here. Although some G.I.s experienced racial discrimination in Vietnam, many found a kinship with their fellow soldiers that transcended skin color. When times got hard, you just had to depend on whoever you was with, and uh, racial problems was the furthest thing from your mind at that time. My best friend, his name was Robert McCarter. He's white, I'm black. And we had talked about going into business together. And he and I both uh, met and became good friends because he was from Knoxville, and I was from Knoxville. That was unusual. But tragedy would strike when a group of Hollywood actors wanted to see the jungle. And believe it or not, we had a lot of entertainers that come over. The Rat Patrol came over. Rat Patrol was a sitcom back here in the States, and it was about World War II soldiers. And uh, they wanted to be in one of those Jeeps with the 60 caliber on it like they did in the film back here. And we were running down the road with them. Uh, performing successful leaps and bounds with them, and all heck broke loose. The troops escorting the actors came under attack by Viet Cong guerrilla fighters. The soldiers moved quickly to protect the entertainers. They got these guys out of there. Got a couple of guys killed behind that, and Robert McCarter was one of them. Uh, they took a direct hit to a PC, uh, and they found him two weeks later. Knoxville native, Robert McCarter had only been in Vietnam three months when he was killed, two weeks before Thanksgiving, 1967. He was 20 years old. 
Sanford Cumberson worked as a crew member on a tank in Dong Hoi, just below the demilitarized zone. I was a gunner at first, and then I got to be a spotter. But if we was in the field, we would fight at nighttime. You could see for miles, but we just had to use a lot of infrared and uh, night vision and all that stuff. Some of them tanks would go for five miles in rounds. So, you know, they, they would just give us a grid and we would just set up and fire. I seen a few direct hits. And then the next morning after you get in a firefight, next morning there's people laying everywhere. William Isom Sr. found that being a vehicle mechanic in Vietnam could be a hazardous profession. We were there to fix the equipment but everything that came back was destroyed, so there really wasn't much maintenance work to be done. So they selected the maintenance people to be guards for a convoy to go to a while and bring supplies back to Anke. As the trucks went through, we just emptied our guns up through there till the trucks got by to keep them down till we'd get where we were going, you know. Yes, it was scary. That was the worst part. Is to send the people that they would kill and leave land on the side of the road to put fear in us, you know, as we came through. 19-year-old James Cook received a disturbing introduction to his job in Graves' registration. There's this guy comes skipping through the tent, and he goes, the calf is coming tonight. The calf is coming tonight. And I said, what's the calf? He said, the first cavalry. I went, oh. He says, yeah, we're having a party tonight. And I said, yes. And about 4 o'clock that afternoon, I heard, whoop, whoop. There's a reefer van, big truck out front. He says, come on, the party's starting. So we go running out, and the guys kind of formed a half circle, and they're going, let the newbie let him out. Let the newbie let him out. So I'm the newbie. <laughs> I go running up to the door, and I grabbed the door, and I yanked it open. And I remember I fell on my knees and screamed for my mother. It was bodies. First calf, I think we had a bunch in from Iron K. How are you, G.I. Joe? Nothing is more confused than to be ordered into a war to die or to be maimed for life without the faintest idea of what's going on. On January 28, 1968, the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong forces launched a massive coordinated attack on U.S. and South Vietnamese bases. The Tet Offensive had begun. Some of the guys ran into human ways, and human ways is when they're charging at you and you are fighting. And the more you bring down, the more they send at you. And it was me. You had to worry about getting overrun by Vietnamese. The choppers and the planes were deployed all over because there was fighting going on all over South Vietnam. And it was hard to get help if you were in combat. Uh, if you were fighting, it was hard to get help. So you became expendable. We had one company up north, D Company. 23rd Engineer Battalion, they got overrun, they was coming over the hill. There's a plane, C-130, landed, and they run and jumped on the plane, and all the only thing they left with was their clothes and their, and their body. We were in whole nine village fighting, and we couldn't get no help. And finally, finally, but if they hadn't came, I don't know what would have happened. You're on your own. You got to fight your way out. The word got to us, and you, 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 you got to fight your way out. The Tet Offensive left over 500 Americans dead. The North Vietnamese dead numbered over 45,000. The only thing I did when that happened was uh, I dug a big trench and buried the Vietnamese in it, gathered them up with a front end loader, dug, threw them off into the hole, and covered it up. That's a stinky job. After processing dead American soldiers for three months at Graves' registration, James Cook had had enough. 
I grabbed my duffel, grabbed my rifle, and I walked down to the end of the airstrip. And I remember a uh, major pulled up, and his driver asked me, said, which way is grave registration? And I pointed. And he says, don't you know how to salute an officer? And I said a few kind words. <laughs> and the officer got out and he said, son, what unit are you with? And I looked at him, I said, I was with grave registration. I'm not going back. He put me in his Jeep and had me transferred the next day. On April 4th, 1967, civil rights leader, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. spoke out against the war in Vietnam. Exactly one year after his speech, troops in Vietnam received bad news from back home in Tennessee. Dr. King had been assassinated. Army leadership feared black soldiers would revolt. The chaplain came by, gave us a hard, hard talk about not worrying about what's going on back in the world, as we call it, uh, because uh, we couldn't do anything about it. And a lot of the guys, a lot of the white guys would walk up to the black soldiers and say, well, it wasn't me, it wasn't me. I guess they were thinking that we were going to turn on our fellow soldiers. Viet Cong guerrilla fighters sympathized with communists in North Vietnam. The Viet Cong were civilians during the daytime and secret soldiers at night. Their brutal sabotage and surprise attacks were a constant threat. During one firefight, Robert Minner discovered the enemy was also his barber. The guy that cut my hair one time back at base camp, I brought his shoes on. They were made by U.S. Royal, and I wore them as house shoes for years. That tells you what you were up against. Fear of enemy attack made sleep a luxury the GIs could not afford. The fear factor was where sleeplessness come in. They were shooting at you at night. That's when a lot, most of the action was, when they thought we were sleeping. I guess in the back of your mind, if I'm awake, I can get away. But where were you going to get away to? There wasn't nowhere to go. Even as the soldiers' tours in Vietnam began to draw to an end, constant vigilance was the only way to stay alive. We were in a situation about 24 sevens, and your life was on the line. So you had to be on the alert at all times. There was no relaxing moment the whole time you were in love. The moment you relaxed, you were in a body bag. James Cook had only one week left in Vietnam when his friend was sent to replace him on guard duty. Swish was kind of an outcast. He was the white guy that hung with the brothers and was outcasted by the other white guys. Swish had grabbed his gear, got on the truck. About four o'clock in the morning, we felt the ground shake. And it was like, I just knew what it was. We got down there, found what was left of Swisher, and it was kind of crazy. He was only one killed. Roger, six, two, seven. Once their tours of duty were complete, soldiers left Vietnam to return to their lives back home. Many found their homecoming would not be what they expected. I didn't have any problems of people spitting on me or anything like that. I did run into one problem. I had my duffel bag, my uniform on, and I'm walking down Gay Street, and I got to the fire hall. The KKK was demonstrating, <laughs> and there was one or two guys standing on State Street. I dropped my duffel bag and turned and looked at them, and they took their hoods off and started running. <laughs> I never will forget that. And the guys, firemen, didn't know what to do. They started laughing. And they said, I hope you're not going to pull anything out your duffer bag, soldier. That got me back to the States. And then when I got out, the, I felt like it was just over, you know. And I found out that nobody even really cared that you was even in there, you know. And back then, nobody even talked about it, you know. I think the real 
issue was the indifference of Americans toward their sacrifice, that hostility. Indifference is hard to take, especially when you've sacrificed like that, in comparison to the World War II veteran and the celebration of service. And that indifference, um, I think, is something that many Vietnam vets felt deeply. But for many Vietnam veterans, the war would follow them home. Some began showing symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. Well, when I came home, I couldn't sleep with my wife for probably four to six weeks. I'd sleep by myself because you'd wake up running, fighting, or doing anything. You know, it just flies by us. At the time I was over there, I, I'd slept maybe 10 minutes a night. Didn't do no sleeping. And when I got home, didn't sleep none. It was, it was years, I guess, 20, 30 years before I got to where I could sleep. For some, their experiences in Vietnam had devastating consequences. In 1968, I attempted suicide. It was like, that was the first time that Vietnam caught up with me. And I woke up in Walter Reed Army Hospital in a straitjacket doing the Thorazine shuffle. I had been there for three days and I had no idea why. And the doctor told me, he says, you hung yourself. And I said, I did what? He says, you hung yourself. I said, you're joking. An acclaimed martial artist, Cook relied on this discipline to help his recovery. I would get up and go to the end of the Bay Area and I just run martial arts forms up and down the Bay Area. And I'd do it till maybe three, four o'clock in the morning, get a couple hours of sleep. The problem for governments with PTSD and those kinds of traumas is that the people we want to think of as warriors and as our supporters and the people who fought for us come back often damaged in a way that indicts the war itself. That's not the story that governments want to tell about warfare. And so what people who suffer these kinds of traumas in many ways are telling us is the unofficial history. Um, about how, what warfare really does to them and others. But for many Vietnam veterans, even talking about their experiences can be traumatic. I remember going to see one of my first psychologist counseling session. And he was a young guy. And he, he asked me what I did you know, and I'm telling him about grave registration. And he looked at me and he said, so why does body bagging bother you? I grabbed him. It took three corpsmen to get me off of him. I'm like, have you even ever picked up a dead rat, a dead squirrel, a dead dog? You know, and... And people want to know why... Vets don't want to talk about it. Here I am at the uh, later years of my life, and I'm just now beginning to, to cope with it, uh, to talk about it. Uh, I don't go to fireworks. New Year's Eve, I used to go to church. I quit doing that because uh, I found myself laying on the floor, at, even at the house, when the fireworks go off. Uh, you hear those guns going off, and I don't care how old you get, once you have been in combat, your first reaction is to hit the floor. I crawled up under the pews, and it's kind of embarrassing because a lot of folks don't understand what you've been through. And it'll eat you up if you let it. You know, and I have a problem with PTSD now, and I know what triggered it, and I know what it is, and where it's coming from, but I just try to keep pushed out of my mind, you know, because you can let it destroy you and everybody around you if you dwell on it. The Vietnam War was the first major conflict in American history in which the military was fully integrated. And whether they were draftees or volunteers, 
African Americans once again prove their valor on the battlefield. This is one of the things that has always amazed me about African Americans, and that is that regardless of how this country has treated us, we have volunteered for every war this country has ever fought, every single war, and many times enthusiastically. That was also true during Vietnam. There is a tradition of proud military service among black men in this country. One of the Arvins, the uh, South Vietnamese regular soldiers, want to know why I was over there fighting when I was not free at home. And I, at that time, I didn't have an answer for him. And as I reflect back on it now, you know, and if I met that same soldier again, and I would tell him that I'm a true American, 